Welcome to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast and our week in sports cars show. You know, we have a bit of a dynamic rotating cast in recent months. Sometimes it's me, the guy whose name is on the podcast. Sometimes it's not me. Sometimes it's my friend and regular co-pilot, Graham Goodwin from DailySportsCar.com. Sometimes it's his young Jedi, Stephen Kilby. And sometimes, like today, it's me and it's Stephen. Mr. Kilby, how are you? I'm great, Marshall. And how are you? I have not consumed enough coffee this Thursday morning, August 22nd, but we can't use that as an excuse for my mediocrity. Now, we have firm phone calls that you need to make in 75 minutes. You know what that means? It's going to be a roughly 75-minute show. Shall we dispense with the flappity gums about things that don't involve questions from our listeners and fire right into all that have been submitted? I think that's a great plan. But by 75 minutes, I'm sure you mean this is going to go on for hours and hours, right? No. In Marshall Throat time. Well, yes, but no. That We're actually going to do something crazy and actually stick to the time set out up front. So since Graham is my official chooser of categories from IMSA, WEC, General, Fun, etc., we're going to pass that baton to you for the week. Where shall we start, young Mr. Kilby? Should we start with WEC, Aslam's, Elms, and Echo? We absolutely can, which means I fire the questions into you. We're going to go first with our man, James Hewitt. James, thank you for always sending in interesting items. He says, at this point, I know it's far away, but how many grandfathered LMP1 cars are looking to be used along alongside hypercars for their debut season? Well, I think right now, um, don't, I don't think anybody knows. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where we're going to have to wait and see once we get into the sort of rank and file races during this upcoming WC season to sort of see how healthy the programs we've got are. We've obviously got two rebellions turning up at Silverstone, which is a fantastic surprise rather than just the one that was originally entered. We've got two NNC Genettas, um, and I think the plan is for at least three of those to do the entire season. Beyond that, it's it's going to be a bit of a waiting game for all of us to find out just where their plans are beyond this season because it, it remains to be seen just how these cars are going to be balanced with hypercars. It's not going to be easy, and, and I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll agree with that, Marshall, Balancing completely different formulas with each other is, is never easy, as we saw with, with what IMSA had to do with DPs and LP2s. Um, so I think once we get more detail from from the ACO and the FIA on just how they're going to do it and whether or not that can be effective, we'll, we'll, um, we'll then find out more as to whether Rebellion wants to continue and whether LNT wants to continue. But right now, I think everyone's just focused on, on the current season um, and seeing how far we can get into that. I also appreciate the fact, Stephen, that in wanting to honor your dear patron, Mr. Goodwin. In the very first question, you've used Graham's official phrase on the weekend sports cars. Let's wait and see. Uh, We're going to go to Neil Hardy next. The announcements of entries for the forthcoming Asian Le Mans series seem to be all prototypes. They're welcome, but why does the Asian Le Mans series not attract GT teams from Blancpain, Asia, Japanese Super GT, or China GT? No date clashes, so is it tires, culture clashes, with the ACO, or what? It's a multitude of reasons. Uh, I think if you spoke to the Asian Le Mans series directly about this, they would say it's you know there aren't um, specific clashes in in calendars on weekends for for most of the championships out there. But as we know, when you're racing in Asia, it's it's not as easy to get from circuit to circuit. It's you know they don't use. Uh, traditional race trucks instead the cars are shipped so it takes a long time to get the cars from circuit to circuit which means it's logistically very difficult for a team to do multiple championships with the same car because they send them off in a freight uh, in a sort of container and they might not see it for months on end and with the Asian Le Mans series going to places like Japan um, going to Thailand and you know these aren't close by so it's, it's difficult commitment for somebody to say I want to do the Asian Le Mans series but I also want to do you know the full Blanc Pan GT Asia series or, or even just a couple of rounds so it's, it's part 
exactly that. And I think also in Asia, we've often seen that there's far more appetite from teams and drivers to want to be able to compete for overall wins. That's why prototype racing in Asian Le Mans has been so popular. Um, it's it's also why the GTs hasn't hasn't been quite as popular as I think the Asian Le Mans series guys would like. Um, when they race in Blanc Pan Asia, they get a, a solid a solid format. They get the sort of plug in and play SRO meetings that you see globally. And if you run a GT3 car in those meetings, you're competing for overall wins. If you're in the Asian Le Mans series, you're you're looking at you know finishing two classes below below the front the guys racing at the front for overall wins. So I think that's part of it as well. That is suitably covering the multitude of reasons right there my man let's go mm-hmm. to matt at hockey hawkins 96 do you think that the wc would adopt the f1 lighting system for pit stops personally all right we got to th- we are throwing up the red card here for those who don't know and maybe you don't matt if you use the word personally on any of my podcasts it has to be me personally hashtag me personally it's the phrase i hate most i think there might even be a t-shirt coming with hashtag me personally on it so just a little style guide here can't just use personally it's got to be hashtag me personally um personally i prefer them as they are now within wc just an idea what says you mr kilby I must admit, it's not something I've ever considered uh, when thinking about WC pit stops and how that all works. There's obviously benefits to them, otherwise the um, Formula One wouldn't use them. Um, but it, it appears from, from the races I've watched in WC, there's not a major issue with uh, pit stops in the way that the lollipop mans are used, or lollipop men are used. Good God, grammatically, that's terrible. Um, but I think it's, it, it comes down to cost doesn't it with a lot of these things and it's not cheap to suddenly go out and adopt one of those systems for for all of the teams up and down the grid be it um, gtm and and p2 it's already an expensive championship as it is for some of these sort of customer run efforts so using a a man standing there with a lollipop is is probably going to be cheaper and i think that would that would obviously sway a decision like that but it's certainly something that you would you could see once we get into hypercar what once that you've got new manufacturers in and they're all um, going at it, you could see them maybe adopting it in the, in the top class. But but honestly, I don't think that's even on the agenda at the moment. It's not something I've ever heard discussed. Would we'll just add in quickly that when you're talking about teams attempting to do sub two second pit stops, one of the items to strip away that can potentially add unnecessary tenths of a second is that interaction between the driver and whichever person is is releasing them through hand signals, through the lollipop, etc. That's always something, if we watch IndyCar, for example, although those pit stops take seven, seven, six and a half, seven seconds, maybe eight in some instances, uh, even those you can see where the system in some teams where they have the driver look to a person to release them can add unnecessary little fractions of time other teams have different practices where the driver will look in their rearview mirror and watch the car being refueled in the moment they see the refueling probe being pulled that's their own signal to go and they've obviously been alerted beforehand that all the tires have been changed everything is safe we see that happen at times in sports car racing as well where the driver is just trained to look forward, make sure that whichever person is holding the car gives them the all clear because there's no other car coming down pit lane, therefore a release would be safe. Provided that scenario is painted, the driver is then looking in the mirror, waiting to see the refueling probe come out. That's their signal to go. But we're talking about a sports car stop that can take 10, 20, lots, many multiples of what a Formula One stop is. So the lighting system, which I think just removes that extra little fraction when you're fighting to get under two seconds, totally makes sense. In a rather (laughs) relaxed, by comparison, uh, endurance racing pit stop, I think I'm with you, Stephen. I don't see the immediate need, but hey, who knows? Let's throw more technology at it. Uh, Let's go (laughs) to Grim Brother 1. He says, Lamar has its centenary coming up here in the near future with its actual 100th running following not long after. Might this milestone entice major players to come out 
and try and steal a potentially even more significant victory, maybe more than a, quote, normal year would? Or do you think would have no bearing on involvement? Automakers do love their anniversary celebrations, after all. Big OEMs will be monitoring it, won't they, Marshall? You know, what? As, as this, is, this guy, Grimbob Ron, clearly points out that anniversary celebrations, we see them all the time between manufacturers, events, championships. They love it. They love, you know, the fact that you can get people along to events maybe the, that you wouldn't normally because they think they're going to see a big part of history. And the 100th running of the Le Mans 24 Hours will be a big deal when it happens. It's just that we, we need to wait and see what the regulations look like then. If it's a, a, sustainable, a sustainable package that can get you to the Le Mans 24 Hours for a big manufacturer, then it's going to be a draw, isn't it? What was it like, Marshall, between the 99th and the 100th running of the Indy 500? Did it make a big difference, you think, when, when that happened? Not from a manufacturer standpoint, but just the sense of occasion the the true feeling of it being the 100th was there was truly something there it was very magical for the entire as it's called month of may so i don't recall if the television ratings were significantly higher i can't tell you if the other things that you think that might be amplified around the event because it is such a major milestone if those things fell in line with expectations, I, I would think they would have. But nonetheless, it was it was a rather amazing thing to be a part of. And I mm. can tell you, uh, I've kept every little piece of memorabilia or the program from the event or whatever else because, to be hell, I wasn't there for the first. Uh, but being able to be there for the 100th, um, again, just based on numbers with it having started in, 1911 uh having been there for the uh the 100th occasion of the event uh falling that was pretty amazing so i would think it would certainly interest manufacturers for Le Mans. would just say that boy a lot different dynamic though right steven if we're thinking about as a team we want to compete in the indy 500 and say the 100th you buy a car you do a few things it's it's a million or two dollars but it's nothing crazy uh, for a manufacturer to want to opt into something like that at Le Mans, the costs to do that would be <laughs> anything but insignificant. So that's the only mm-hmm. thing where I question whether this would actually happen, not because there's a lack of willingness, but because the the fearsome costs involved to do such a thing. I think the spirit within most auto manufacturers today would not necessarily align actually i think if we're talking 20 years ago if the 100th was 20 years ago at le mans i think we would have seen a number of manufacturers say yes we're going to pour gobs of money in to do this i just don't see that culture really existing much more these days in motor racing so Mm. a great idea just not sure the industry is at that place anymore i could see a brand like porsche eyeing that up though Maybe they you think? go there with a GT car. Yeah, that would be awesome. Awesome. Um, all right, let's move on to Justin at J underscore truck underscore 71. I love Twitter handles. Although we are still a full season out, any word on which of the Aston Martin GTE Pro drivers might get a seat in a hypercar? Also, does Aston Martin have enough factory drivers to fill hypercar, GTE Pro, and GTE Am? in 2021 and beyond there's no word yet uh, when you speak to the gt pro drivers at aston martin there is a bit of a wry smile because they think that you know their performance this year is going to be looked at um some of uh, some of the sort of rumors around the paddock swirling about how this program is going to come together suggests that we could see you know some big drivers outside of aston martin's current stable of factory guys um coming into this program at the moment though the big focus is going to be on developing the car getting the program fully up to speed and then you start thinking about drivers once you've got a cars getting closer to hitting the track uh, for testing and and all development work like that right now it's full steam ahead with just getting getting all the sort of big parts of the development cycle underway and making sure that the car is ready for somebody to actually drive 
So you think people would want a car to be ready to drive before we lock mm. down other minutia? Mm. That's a crazy, you and your crazy youthful ideas. Uh, <laughs> let's see. We're going to go to Daniel Peters. He says, with Brendan Hartley now signed with Dragon Racing in Formula E and clashes still between the WC and Formula E, specifically Sebring, what are the chances of Fernando Alonso returning for a one-off drive at Toyota, bearing in mind the expected increased competition in LMP1 from non-hybrids? I would say it's unlikely right now. Uh, he, he appears to be one step back from it for a while. Um, once we get into hypercar and once we've had a bit of a refresh of the regulations and we maybe have a bit of a stronger platform at the front of the field, that's when I, I believe you'll, you'll see him looking to come back. For now, he uh, there seems to be sort of the, the thought that he's going to do Dakar, which is, you know, he's been out testing with Toyota doing that sort of stuff. So he, he's having a look around at different parts of motorsport right now and, and I'm sure he'll be gunning for Indianapolis again uh, to complete the Triple Crown before he starts seeing him back in sports cars. I think he'll be back at some point, but um, Sebring next year, I, I, I highly doubt at the minute that will happen. Okay, where else can we go here? We sh- I should have mentioned up front that due to operator error, with me being the operator, uh, we managed to send out a call for questions on Twitter while I believe for the first time uh, completely dropping the good old fart in church and uh, i failed to post a call for questions on facebook so we are not overwhelmed with questions this week all my fault uh let's see da, 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 da. last week we heard according to daniel peters that Areka boss hugh to has been speaking to various manufacturers regarding developing a hypercar prototype do you know who or care to speculate who it may be young stephen kilby I certainly care um, whether whether they would be prepared to come out and say who they're talking to right now. I think that's highly unlikely. The last time I spoke to Hugh de Schoenach was at Le Mans in June. Back then he was telling me that they are looking at options. I think they're going to cast a wide net and look for any aspirant manufacturers that are looking to come into this new regulation set. Right now, though, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, Marshall, it's 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 always difficult when you're at this stage um, of, of a new regulation set and trying to nail down exactly who's talking to who, uh, because they won't always tell you um, the truth when you ask them, will they? It's fun hearing non-answers. I mean, that might actually be something for me to start capturing. I don't know why I didn't think this earlier, but... My favorite non-answer answers. Those are just always a gem where you go. Sometimes, actually, it's even better when you know the answer. Mm. You still need to ask the question, hoping the person will give you the accurate answer. And when they don't, uh, that's probably those are the times when I should be documenting the little word dance. The uh, zero-calorie meal of words coming back. Go to... I'm not even going to attempt the name Bren Holtzverle, Upper Franconia, at Hotel <laughs> underscore Oscar. <laughs> this is so awesome. Uh, with the new WC season ahead of us, where is TDS racing? Where have they gone? Don't they have the capacities to run their own team besides G Drive and Racing Team Niederland? And what happened to Larva competition? Stephen, tell us where people are, where they aren't, what they're doing, what they aren't doing. They're running the Racing Team Netherland effort in WC, and it's all down to commercials when it comes to P2 teams. Uh, before it was Francois Perodo's effort, they were sort of drafted in to run that. This time it's it's what Fritz van Erd has with Racing Team Netherland and him wanting to to change to running an Oracle this year from a Dallara, and they've picked TDS quite rightly because of their pedigree as, as the team that they want to do that. It's a it's a business model that TDS uses and many other teams up and down the paddock do, um, in that they look up and down at potential customers, be it gentlemen drivers or or drivers that run with budget looking to break into you know big-time factory racing, and they help them run programs. And I think that's certainly what they're doing. Uh, they certainly have resources and, and the capacity to run multiple programs they have in the past. Um, Right now, they're just not running under their own banner. They're doing it for other teams. As for Labra, it's all gone a bit quiet. Um, there was sort of rumours that we would see them back. After all, there were all 
sorts of stuff uh, being banded around about whether they would return with Ligia again, give them some representation in the WC. But as we know with Jacques Lecomte, it's not always 100% um, you know, in the confidence scale all the time of what you're going to get from him and his efforts because you know, he runs a very commercial effort these days. Uh, we sort of wait and see what he'll do next. We'd, we'd heard talk about them potentially venturing into racing with Corvette again in the GT ranks. That hasn't happened as of yet. Um, it's you know, it's, it's a shame with when you see a team like like Labra, uh, who have been around for so long, won so many big races and, and titles, um, kind of having a quiet season, um, unlike what we're used to seeing, and then and then stepping away. Um, I'm sure he's always planning to be back, though. Uh, so if you're a fan of Labra, I wouldn't say it's all completely gone 100% quiet, but right now it, it looks like there isn't much in terms of a program. Two questions left, as it sounds like you're, I don't know, playing with, 143rd scale models in the background uh two questions left in weck aslam elms aco this comes from our man stathis coco who says given the changes in weck this season shall we expect a cheaper stream service subscription making it free will be ideal but at least reducing the price is a must to keep most of the subscribers held over from last season uh, I don't know what to expect in terms of cost right now. Um, as I said last week when we had questions about the WC streaming package and the timing and scoring, there isn't full details yet. Uh, I imagine that they'll be released very soon because Silverstone's right around the corner. Um, so I can't speculate. Uh, it would it'd be nice to see them offer you know, a cheaper service to sort of get new people on board and to keep the fans that have been supporting that service over the years a uh, reason to keep coming back. Um, but we'll have to wait and see in the words of Graham. I believe that's your third use of wait and see, like we mm-hmm. did for the first year or so of the Weekend Sports Cars podcast. We limited ourselves to three uses of balance of performance per show. Sometimes we went over, but we tried to go to three. You've already hit three wait and sees, and we're not even done <laughs> with Weck Asim Albzaco. Good Lord, you're an animal there, Kilby. All right, we're going to go to uh, Daniel or Daniel or I don't know. This is also known as the Marshall Pruitt Can't Pronounce Things podcast. <laughs> Last question here. The Megabus coach service from Silverstone to London is still running to the same timetable as it would for a six-hour race, leaving three hours after the checkered flag instead of one. How many finishers do you think will be disqualified between the flag dropping and the bus leaving, Stephen? Fingers crossed there are no disqualifications after the race. I know we see that quite a lot now in sports cars all around the world and during big race weekends. Fingers crossed nobody gets disqualified because uh, I must admit for those of us in the press room that are sitting there waiting once you get the word, um, be it from a media delegate or somebody down the paddock that somebody's being investigated, you can be there for uh, from anything from like an hour or two after a race to six hours to the next day to weeks and months later, as we know, um, I'm going to place a bet here and say zero. What about you, Marshall? Go on for a number in there. Zero. God, that is just, you are funny. You are funny. I would say if we do not conclude the first race of this new super season without three disqualifications and or significant penalties i will be very surprised i think Mm. you're failing to recognize the although cars were racing not too long ago i think you're failing to realize the new season new everything technical changes in whatever areas new developments to cars first races tend to be the ones where lots of people get popped so if it is zero we're going to need to ask our listeners to come up with what I owe you or what I need to buy you if you are correct and I am wrong. So we're, we're doing a wager here. We don't know what the wager is. We live too far away to actually do funny or cruel things to one another in person. So it would probably <laughs> have to be purchasing of something for failing. And I won't say that you need to buy something for me if you end up failing and I win the bet because you're young and you don't make a lot of money. But yeah. So send us your ideas. If Kilby wins, if it's zero disqualifications or major penalties assessed, what do I owe him? 
And speaking of O, I'm done. I believe I have paid everything that is necessary here in reading you, your Weck Aslam Elms Echo questions. Where shall we go next in the good old plate of offerings? Let's go, Emza. Let me let, let me take over the reins of asking the questions, Marshall. We're going to Wimsa. We're okay. going to start off with Baxter on USCR Reddit. Never heard of him. With, <laughs> with the expected exit of John Bennett from the prototype class and the prior exits of John Pugh and Ed Brown, where does that leave participation of am- amateurs in the top class of Wimsa competition going forward? As best I can tell, there's a tradition that goes way back nearly as long as the series itself, with only limited interruptions in LMS LMP1 when Greg Pickett stepped out of a racing seat. I think we are going to see some rather interesting things take place. I cannot get into it yet. I would love to reveal all things on our weekly podcast here, Stephen. Frankly, some things I'm still, some stories I'm still working a little bit. So coming back to Monsieur Baxter's question, I would not rule out the fact that the Nissans could be piloted next year in the series, first of all, and piloted secondarily in some sort of pro-am dynamic. So wouldn't rule that out altogether. I will be working on this. Who knows? This We're recording this Thursday morning, California, the 22nd. I'm hoping to have a story up here somewhat soon about some interesting things I've heard about. I would think that we will have that happening. I have heard of another possible program coming online in DPI that could certainly be Pro-Am infused, if that's the word. Uh, I think there might be a little something here continuing. I would hesitate from saying we're going back to the good old days where Rob Dyson and Jim Busby and run on down the line of successful businessmen who are also very talented race winning drivers, but nonetheless a very strong contingent of pro am dynamics played out on the big stage, stood in victory lane in IMSA GTP WSC days and whatnot in IMSA. Not saying we're going back there. I don't think we're going to have a lot more of the John Pews and Ed Browns and John Bennett's come in and then stay for a long time. But I do think at least maybe short term here until this current DPI formula is done. I think we might have one or two coming here in 2020 that would be using existing DPI machinery. So hopefully I have more to flesh out there. Coming back to the primary question here. I know DPI is a top level and LMP2 has been intentionally shifted to a pro-am dynamic only and now we have a reduced calendar as well to fit the budget so we don't really have the possibility of this truly equitable thing where there's one prototype class and anybody who wants to race professional or amateur you got one choice IMSA has created something that is truly for a pro-am model just takes away the takes away some of the reasoning i would say to do this Stephen. Uh, if we think about what we have now in imsa in gt Le Mans, and gt daytona gtd is by rule pro-am model there's the ability for teams to compete in gtlm as amateurs we just haven't seen anyone really step up and try and do that so i would expect as we move forward in the future especially into this new dpi formula that's coming in 22 i do believe by then we might be done with seeing any kind of pro-am attempts at that level mm. it's carrying on with another question that's sort of related to the the core exit from dpi this is uh, j underscore truck underscore 21 fantastic twitter handle does the core Nissan DPI program coming to an end have an effect on Nissan's DPI 2.0 plans, or will finding new teams to run the car not be an issue? Also, any update on Chip Ganassi Racing? It seems to me that any new manufacturer hoping to join for DPI 2.0 will be smart to lock in Ganassi now. 
Great questions, timely questions. Interesting thing to mention here, just an overall clarification on what I understand with Nissan and their participation in DPI 2.0 meetings so far. I I would hesitate in claiming their presence there is some sort of window into future interests on their part. Uh, I would say that they're a current manufacturer. They are looking to where the series might go, whether they could supply, make money, actually have this as a profit center to be hired by someone. I've heard nothing, though, about Nissan as a brand wanting to participate as a manufacturer. On a true, we are spending money and are building cars and selling them on our own. That's not how this program came together to begin, obviously. This is something that Ed Brown, ESM, Scott Sharp commissioned them. Uh, I don't know how to phrase this properly, but effectively bought their interest, and that's great. Um, Here's what I know has been the reality, Stephen, since... ESM shut down and the core team purchased the assets very late. And there were other teams that were interested in buying those assets. Ed Brown, Patron, Tequila, money from that organization made Nissan a, quote, manufacturer in DPI. Without the money from that privateer team, there was never a point where Nissan was going to do this on their own. Uh, truly commit to do something on their own. Not saying there was never any interest, but truly the the facilitation of this came from privateer money. When ESM shut down, those cars ended up being sold along with all the spares, all the everything. Not saying cheap, but certainly at a very favorable rate. And coming with that was absolutely nothing from Nissan. So not only did CORE need to come out of pocket again to pay for support, pay for engine lease, pay for et cetera, et cetera. Nissan was not even willing to pay the marketing agreement to IMSA, which can float between, from what we understand, 600000 to up to a million dollars. That's something the CORE team, Stephen, had to (coughs) agree to on their own. So... Where this gets a little weird, Justin, is could we see another team buy these cars, continue to run them? Absolutely. That's definitely a possibility. Purchase from core, go race in DPI. You still have that question of how do you handle that? We'll just call it round numbers a million dollars. How do you handle that million dollar obligation? Whatever it ends up being with IMSA, well, that too would be on the team. Nissan has expressed no interest in doing anything out of their own pocket related to DPI. So if someone's paying for it, great. Anything other than that? Hmm. I think the situation I'm I'm looking at a few years down the road for the 2.0 DPI stuff, Stephen, is that if Nissan can find someone who wants to pay them to do that, as Ed Brown and ESM did, great. Would they actually do that on their own, hoping to lure a customer in? I don't know. I really can't see that happening. Final mention here on the Nissan front is there were a lot of changes during the offseason, a lot of layoffs in terms of the engineering support and personnel behind uh, a lot of the really smart stuff they do in prototypes. I would say of the three manufacturers that build DPIs, that being Delara, Multimatic now. I know Riley Multimatic is the name of the current chassis, but it's 100% Multimatic and Delara. I would say Liget is probably the one that has the biggest question mark next to it simply because of the lack of support from the manufacturer and also the significant personnel changes going there, going on there during the off season leading into this year. And so if I am a team wanting to get into DPI and looking at cars that are readily available, great, the Nissans are there, but even our friend, the great engineer, Jeff Brown, and the wickedly talented Colin Brown, 
guys that won a number of races last year in him. So using a, an Areca 07 spec LMP two car, granted the BOP certainly was good, but the, this is a team that was winning last year with a spec P two car and more often than not has struggled to be competitive this year in Nissans that were very competitive last year and the year before. So my fear here, not just for the upcoming season, Stephen, but also DPI 2.0 is this is the one combination that might not jump out as truly a super strong one to opt into. Hoping folks do. I just know that if we started Pruitt Kilby Motorsports and had the budget to go DPI racing next year, I would not be looking to buy those Nissans. And if we were planning to debut in 22 and wanted to see what was available, at least in its current guise, I would not be ringing Liget. Uh, I would hope that they would bolster themselves, maybe find another manufacturer that wanted to collaborate to put a car together. Um, but at least in its current makeup, not so much. Closing here on Justin's other question about CGR. I can tell you this, and this is something that I'll probably just throw into the thing that I'm writing. Nothing super surprising here, but just doing my somewhat regular checks, checking in with folks, continue to hear how few options the rather amazing driver lineup Ford has assembled in IMSA, what those folks are finding for employment opportunities. And it's also the case, which is the norm, Stephen, of all those drivers showing up on the same doorstep, not at the same time necessarily, but uh, everyone's knocking on the same doors. Hi, what do you have next year? Hi, what do you have next year? Mm. Not hearing much in the way of, aha, and here's a full-time opportunity. Mentioned this a couple months ago when it was, you know, looking like this could be the reality of the program shutting down altogether. There have been some opportunities presented that would fall more in the NAEC, the four long haul endurance races in IMSA for some of Ford's drivers. But we're staring at a situation next year for sure where new opportunities, uh, proper doors being opened to bring in a higher grade of driver at some teams, give some of these, you know, Ford GT drivers new homes, either with manufacturers and GT. DPI, privateer DPIs, you name it. Slim pickings right now. So definitely a concern there. Makes me wonder on one of the last topics you covered uh, in your segment with WAC, whether some of these four GT drivers have already spoken with Aston Martin or should be, or some of the hypercar opportunities there, knowing that in, I think, what, all but one case, the drivers are either from down under or Europe and whatnot, have a, a very strong legacy uh, in Europe, would not be too strange a thing to consider that uh, some of them might actually be of interest to a British manufacturer. So there's that. And then finally on Ganassi, keep hearing there's hope. Hope that Chip's going to find something. I have heard about one thing. I don't know if I would say it, it jumps out to me as a 2020 option, but I, I've heard that there's something interesting that could happen. As usual, I'd love to mention it here, but until I fully flesh that thing out to find out whether it's real or not, I still have to do that work. Mm. We carry on with Big Racer Boy on USCR Reddit. He says this is a question about DPI manufacturers. Hold Since on, unfortunate- Stephen, it's not Big Racer Boy. It's Big Racer Boy in a very public enemy flavor flavor way. I mean, there are one, two, three, four, five, six. I think there's about eight eyes at the end of boy. So I need mm. you, because it's going to be hilarious, to pronounce it correctly. Okay. Big Racer Boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we you have the highlight of it. the episode. <laughs> Yes, and he asks, this is a question about DPI manufacturers. Since the unfortunate news about Nissan's DPI is uncertain slash certain fate, and we've uh, and we're showing ha- how having no real manufacturer support and interference can um, do with a program, what can we what can be done in the future to make this remedied? Hmm. 
I don't know if there is an actual remedy that can be applied, Mr. Boy. I also think, Stephen, we need to set a new policy as well. Any question that comes in from Big Racer Boy that includes a word that ends like his last name in the screen name with the letter I, like DPI needs to be pronounced in the same way. So I think just a style okay. guide adjustment here, that's going to have to be the new thing. Hopefully we're okay. We'll I'm sure people won't week. find that annoying. Oh, I mean, they listen to us. Clearly they accept annoying from the outset. I don't think there's anything that can be done here. Well, let me rephrase that. Of course, there's something that could be done practically. I cannot think of anything IMSA could implement in rules, private agreements, or otherwise that forces a manufacturer to do something they do not want to. They can certainly put that in print and put that in front of a manufacturer in most instances because of the si- the disparity in the size of the organizations. It's little IMSA trying to dictate to big domestic international auto brand those manufacturers just push that back and say no 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 you keep that if you want to stick to that great enjoy your series we'll watch from afar or go get a red marker and line some of this nonsense out the reality is nissan was hired to be a service provider that's not a negative the esm team in this instance they were unable to get other DPIs. Mazda was not selling. Uh, if we're looking about when this came together, Acura had yet to join the series, and Cadillac was being very, very restrictive about who it made its DPI VRs available to. So out of necessity, knowing that they wanted to continue racing in IMSA with a DPI, the team said, all right, well, How do we circumvent the limitations here? We have the money. We just are not being given the access. And so they said, cool. We love working with Liget. Hey, could you do a DPI for us? Wonderful. Now we just need to find a manufacturer we can hire to supply those engines and kind of opt in to being a, and I'm doing air quotes, manufacturer with us in terms of presentation to the public. And so Nissan did that. Nissan said, great, we will happily take your money. We will happily do this. We are a business through Nismo. We will build engines, supply them. We will provide technical support. We're going to do the bodywork styling, which we know from the outset was very uninspired. IMSA pushed back. IMSA's Mark Raffoff, who's been there forever, actually drew what he thought the front of the car should look like and has ended up being pretty darn close. So IMSA actually came back and said, no, 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 no. I know you want to do this on the lowest possible grade of involvement, but if you're going to do this, we're going to make it look unique, which they have. I just don't know of any practical thing you could put in print that would obligate a manufacturer to uh, get, quote, more involved, since it is a business being hired to provide support and not the manufacturer saying we want to be there. I I think we just have to honor what it is, which is the instability that can come like we have seen now. And if this does happen, Stephen, if these Nissans find a new home, it is a little bit odd to think that three years in a row, these cars will be run under three different banners. That in mm. and of itself speaks to the somewhat precarious nature of having a manufacturer hired to be there instead of wanting to be there. Mm. Moving on, we've got a question from Michael Metropolis, who says, while the C8 will again use a small engine block, video suggests that the C8R will have a flat plane crank V8 instead. Is it possible that they're using a unique engine for the C8R due to balance of performance? Definitely possible, Michael. You have picked up on, as have many, that, hey, this doesn't sound like the same old big rumbling V8 that we've heard in the C7R. At least for the drive-bys, flybys, whatever it might be, videos that I've seen of the C8 running around, I'm not sure that I have heard that same exhaust note. Granted, we're talking about a car, production car, 
that has what the hell's going on there, Kilby? Uh, I don't know. What is going on? I don't know. I keep hearing things get knocked over and, and thrown around. Are you in a fight with somebody? Uh, uh, is there something going on beneath the table uh, not, that we should I'm know not, about? I'm not. It might be somebody like in the kitchen or something. I'm not sure. You're doing this in the kitchen? No, I'm I'm doing this in the dining room at the moment. In the dining room? Man, luxurious. Mm. This is awesome. And we're not going to edit this out because why would we? Um, I think, what Michael, we might there might very well be something like this that is specific to IMSA because at least noting the mufflers and other things that would mask the sound a little bit of the road car C8, at least unfiltered, the C8R does not have that same traditional V8 rumble. So can't say if it's strictly flat plane, if it's just higher revs being used instead of it being the lower rev uh, motor that we have heard in the C7R. I can't tell you. I don't know. But I am among those who are very interested to learn what it is that makes it sound so unique. I think in one description I wrote somewhere, uh, it, it sounds a, a lot like, not completely, but it's it reminds me of Ferrari's 458, its previous generation prior to going to the twin turbo V8. So it has that a similar V8 ring to it uh, with that Ferrari, which I'm sure Chevrolet would love to hear me say. But, yeah, can't wait to find out what it is that's causing it. Hmm. I think you've kind of covered Rob Charm's question mostly, but have you got any other thoughts on uh, with, with the core project uh, co- coming to a close? Can we expect another manufacturer to pick up Ligio before the DPI uh, 2022 regs kick in? Definitely not before. I uh, would say, Rob, that it would be a silly expenditure for any brand or any man- new manufacturer to say, we're coming to IMSA in a very short window with a car that doesn't have a whole lot of lifespan left in it uh, would, if anything, I could see a manufacturer, if they had an interest in working with Liget to buy the cars and use those as test mules and put their motor, play with aero, etc., to do that behind the scenes as they prepare for coming in for the first time in 22. But no, uh, I would struggle to see any manufacturer uh, trying to opt in to the Liget on Roke Nissan um, platform and try and use that with their own name and their own motor and, I guess, different or bodywork uh, ASAP. Shall we move on to Henneral? We well, shall. You're again, you are the official chooser, and we have 28 minutes to go. I feel, I feel. As my chair squeaks, I need to apply some JB80 from our amazing sponsors at the Justice Brothers. I feel like we might be able to get through almost everything everyone has Mm. sent in. So should we go, but should we go to general first, knowing that there are eight questions, or should we go to fun, since there's only three, and make sure we get all of those? Let's do fun then. Come on then. Let's do the three questions in fun. Why not? All right, I'll throw this one to you. This comes from our We Believe Man. Could be a woman, could be a robot. SRA Smoking Puppy 841. If you had to come up with a lineup for Lamar comprising fully of people with your initials, who would you have? You could even spice it up as three for each is difficult and come up with a MP, GG, and SK. So, Stephen, who would you choose to represent you in a car at Le Mans that happens to share your initials? I've had a little bit of a think about this. Um, there aren't many SKs I can think of, certainly that would be up to the task. So I'm going to have to go with the top bloke that is Stephen Kane, um, who is a factory driver who's raced in all sorts of things up and down the years and did race in a prototype, I believe, in the American Le Mans series briefly with Dyson. Uh, so I'm going to go with Stephen Kane. How about you, MP? Well... Clearly, you hate our listeners. I was going to suggest Stathis Coco. I mean, he he contributes to this show every week, sends in great stuff. You don't even think of him. That just tells us selfish, selfish man. I'm going to throw in somebody that 
has my initials, has had them longer than I have. And I can't tell you whether he would be the fastest driver, but he certainly knows a lot about Le Mans. More with a keyboard and audio recorder, possibly. That being long time, highly respected PR man, Martin Pass. So I'm going to chuck Martin in there. I believe he would be very safe. Again, I can't really speak to speed, but you want to talk about someone who could spin some wonderful yarns about his efforts and those of his teammates. I think we kind of got a winner there. What about GG? Um, this is a tough one, isn't it? I mean, we could go. Could we go fictional? Go Green Goblin from from? Uh, <laughs> yes, we can from the Marvel universe because you know he goes quickly on his on his speedy thing that he flies on. Yes, the speedy thing. Uh, <laughs> that's that's, that's wonderful. Done. You and your powers of description, Stephen. Yet again, <laughs> fell everyone like a a forest being cut. <laughs> being raised to the ground. Um, we might need some help here too, because I am also, I can think of many single G's. I can't think of any G G's. So maybe our dear listeners, many of you who have captured the most arcane things, which continually impresses me, uh, memories of this sport. Is there a G G that we could truly use from the motor racing world to fill the spot in the MP G G and S K Lamont effort. So send us that information on your chosen form of social medias, the book faces, the tweeters and whatnot. All right, let's see. This comes in from WC Reddit group. If you could have a manufacturer suddenly become a dominant force at Lamont, think how Audi arrived on the scene and what they accomplished. Who would it be? Must not have a Lamont win overall among your choices. And bonus, if they've never really had any serious presence at all? Well, there can only be one answer for me. Are you? Oh, wait, okay. sorry. Uh, I've never. No, have they won at Le Mans before? The Bugatti they should really circuit. market it if they the, have. The Bugatti circuit only, yeah. <laughs> uh, who, all right, what do you think? What, what, give, us, give us a manufacturer that really we don't associate with Le Mans, as some of my country men and women choose to use okay. for their pronunciation what do you think i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with a manufacturer that's currently involved as a factory team i believe in the chinese touring car championship and that is trump chi trumpy trump chi trump as in donald trump with yes. ch on the end trump chi i think that would be great why not it would be great again i believe Yes. I mean, there's already a, apparently a, a full merchandise uh, production effort in place there that, yeah, that I see no faults in that whatsoever. Oh, my God. Mm. Um, they would run for the 100th Le Mans 24 hours. Wouldn't that be hilarious if they oh, won the 100th Le Mans 24 hours? It would be huge. It would be huge. It would be the bigliest racing team ever, knowing how my country and China get along so well. I mean, I just have to imagine this co-entry. Uh, yes, the yes, there's nothing but beauty right there. Uh, let's see, what, what who comes to mind that really doesn't have what they could have there? I mean, there's a number of Asian manufacturers that come to mind. Um, I'll go with one just because I love them. And I realize that there are some ties to other manufacturers, but it would be really cool to see Holden, an Australian assault on the 24 Hours of Le Mans. I would love to see that. And again, I realize there's uh, ties to the good old General and General Motors, but I think that would be fun. It's been a while since those down under have really had whether it's a driver. I mean, I realize Mark Weber was, is the most recent. It's been a few years now, but it's been a while since there's really been a chance to uh, you know, have an entire country turn in, uh, tune in, and cheer uh, for something there. And I think on the manufacturer front, assuming that it would be an all-Aussie driver lineup as well, that I think would be kind of fun. Mm. And so that brings us back to NRL, does it? it well... If you don't want to answer the third one, I mean, right turn lover oh, sent it in. Oh, and apologies. I guess, again, apologies. just showing more hatred for our listeners. 
<laughs> Apologies, I hadn't scrolled down far enough. So yeah, sure, I'll ask this one. It's uh, it's from Right Turn Lover. It says VAR's oak tree term was originally named after after the plant gone since 2013. Uh, what are your favourite circuit parts named after a now gone geographical or topolo- topological element? Good God, that's a question and a half. There's a lot of words in there that my brain don't pronunciate good luck and whatnot. Uh, we have eponymous, geographical, topological. We have favorite with a, a, a U in there and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, wow. I'm going to use the rarely, rarely employed podcast owner's card and say, I'm going to pass this to you, sucker. Thanks, Marshall. And you wonder why I wanted to ask you this question. Oh, no, hey, see, I love our fans. I hate my guests. See, you hate our guests. I, I'm sorry, you hate our listeners. I hate my guests. So, see, I'm trying to stand up for them. I'm fighting back for you, right turn lover. No, I'm not. I have no freaking answer whatsoever, so I'm just punting the, the, over uh, to Kilby here. I'm just going to go with the only one I can even think of, and that's Flance Garden at the uh, at the Nürburgring, which I believe is Flower Garden in Germany. In German, sorry. Um, I believe that's the answer. So can I go with that? Are we cool with that? Yeah, and I can throw in one that it does, doesn't necessarily fit. It, it's the entire circuit, circuit. That is Laguna Seca which is Spanish for dry lake. So it's maybe falls in the topological element or lack thereof, or I don't know, but yeah, um, we love going to WeatherTech Raceway dry lake. And uh, so there you go. Um, all right. Yeah. I love how the only question we get truly stumped on. It's not about engineering. It's not about aerodynamics oh, no. or it's, you know, rules and regulations. It's about plants. <laughs> the absence of plants weather tech raceway there we go um kind of sort of for the large part but not completely all right let's uh let's wrap it up with Hegenerau and what do we want to do do we want to be linear and start with the first question on the page start with the last start in the middle you make it up you do whatever you want you're in charge even though you hate our listeners I know exactly what I want to do because I really want to hear the answer to this question and I want to give you space to answer it. And this is a question from Ryan Terpstra, who is a regular. Hello, Ryan. He's this irregular. You see that? Any opportunity I, I, to tear people down. Gosh. Ryan Terpstra, he's oh, irregular. I would never. How would you know his the composition of his daily bowel movements? That's something I need to know right now. How do you know he's irregular? I... I don't even know what to say to this, Marshall. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still trying to think of an answer to the question about plants and biology. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, and just a big prayer, thoughts and prayers to, to your digestive health, health, Mr. Mm. I can't even pronounce it as well. Thoughts and prayers to your digestive health, Ryan Terpstra. And please don't let Stephen's mockery of this issue drag you down. Mm. I'll, I'll try not to offend you anymore, Ryan, when I, when I read out your question and your question is MP, can you just ramble for 15 minutes about your weekend in Monterey? Uh, he also says on a related note, how much of the paddock do fans get access to at an event like this? Uh, yes, I won't do it for 15 minutes because we only have 17 left. Truly amazing. This is my 10th or 11th year covering the, what is now called the Rolex Monterey Motorsports reunion prior to that, renaming it was just known as the monterey historics which has been going on for decades to answer your last question first ryan it's 100 percent wide open it, that's the best part except for a few circumstances where manufacturers that rent out the garages uh, on the front straight, uh, basically what we would consider Formula One style garages that open up and go out into uh, the paddock, although not directly. But anyways, that area tends each of those stalls tends to be rented out by manufacturers who have something to show. And in some cases, something to hide. They'll do some sort of debut of a vehicle. Actually, Corvette did that. I think 
I forget the exact year, 2013, 14, 15, with the C7R. Its public debut happened almost with no advance warning, rolled the thing out in full dazzle livery, did a couple laps and put it away. Um, Those areas might have a barrier to, you might need to have a little wristband pass to get in there because those are tend to be by invite only. But by and large, everywhere else, Ryan, you walk right up to, you know, $30 million Ferrari, whatever thing that raced at something and is worth more than everybody at the event. It, every scenario is like that. I cannot genuinely cannot think of any crowd barriers being put up anywhere. There's some car owners that might be a little not touchy, but if they have a full awning set up with all their cars beneath the tent, it's never a bad thing to ask if you can walk up and take a look. But for the most part, it's wide open access. Take photos of any and everything from Formula One cars to prototypes, GTs. It's amazing. I always tell folks, it is my annual replenishing of the soul. Uh, usually by this mid-August timing where they hold it each year, Stephen, we've been on the road a lot, tend to be a bit weary just working our normal jobs. So the idea of going to a motor racing circuit <laughs> to cover a motor racing style event might sound like a strange way to replenish the soul, but there's no pressure. There's no anything. It's just pure enjoyment of the, in many cases, the cars and or drivers, because there are many legendary drivers who turn up where you can just enjoy yourself on your own time scale. And that was very much the case. Seeing the great American race car driver, Tommy Kendall, reunited with the 1982 IMSA GTU Mazda RX-7 that launched his career, that really set him on the path towards championships and stardom, reunited with that car for the first time in 30 years or whatever it has been, with its original crew chief, Dan Binks, also known as Corvette Racing's crew chief, the two of them together running the car, and Dan's son, Phil, who works for the Ford Chip Ganassi team, Dan and Phil Binks prepping and running the car, and Tommy in it. It's a magical thing, truly a magical thing. With this being IMSA's 50th anniversary, IMSA was the, quote, featured mark, and so seemingly Stephen half the paddock were cars coming from IMSA's 50 years. It was amazing to see Hurley Haywood, who was the Grand Marshal, just to spend some time with Hurley, just chatting, just catching up with him. Uh, not my brother, Scott Pruitt, was there. Wonderful to see him. Tom Christensen was there. I just posted a video we did of him getting uh, two laps in the new Audi R8 LMS GT2. And you just run on down the list of person after person. Mika Hockenen's this is his third year in a row he's been there. He loves it. Just awesome to chill with Mika for a little while. Shea Holbrook was there. This person was there. That person was there. Uh, it was pretty cool to see a collection, a cluster in the paddock, Stephen, of Mark Weber catching up with IndyCar legend, Indy 500 winner, Danny Sullivan, and I think Christensen was the other one. And so you're just sitting there going, Danny Sullivan, Mark Weber, Tom Christensen, that's a hell of a photo. And everybody that saw it ran over and got photos of them just speaking. So it's that kind of thing where you're there, you're drooling over cars, you're just falling in love with things that you haven't seen, or maybe you're seeing things that you've never even knew about. It's another great thing about the reunion. There's a bunch of weird stuff that shows up every year. And you're like, what? What is that? Where is that from? You get cars that are flown in from Australia, from Japan, from wherever. And it's really cool to see vintage machinery that's invited in from places that, at least to these American eyes, I might not have known about. And I know that other folks enjoy that as well. Uh, you then have some cool things, too, which really appealed to me having grown up in the IMSA GTP era. And that was having two All-American Racers Eagle Mark III GTP cars competing against one another. And that was that was crazy. Awesome. That was super cool. Um, and have in-car of that with Rocky Moran Jr., whose father, Rocky Moran Sr., raced 
the Eagle Mark threes back in the day for the team. That was amazing. Another cool thing, and this is just my own ignorance, of which I have a lot, uh, Nick Manassian was there. Spent some time and interviewed Nick, who's running the Historic Masters Endurance Series. And so that was one guy with a, what, I think it was a 2012 uh, Lola, the X-Status GP. Um, Lola, which now has a Judd V10 in the back of it. And uh, we had Mr. Official show sponsor, Bushu's Hammer Emporium, one of his ex Ferrari 550 Marinellos there being run by Steve Zacchio. They let me throw an audio recorder in there. That's just the really cool thing about this event, Ryan, and anybody else that might have an interest in going to it. You walk around the paddock. There are usually 500 or so cars invited to every reunion, and it takes place over four days. Most people come out for Saturday only because they go to Pebble Beach for the concours on Sunday morning. But it's four days, and if you really want to do it properly, you need to be there all four days because you will cover one portion of the paddock, get all the photos, talk with the people, talk with the drivers, see the legends, get the autographs, go to the little uh, symposiums and whatnot they have with a variety of people, come back on Friday, pick another portion. And uh, we also get some cool clusters too, Stephen, that take place where For the most part, all the pre-war cars uh, happen to paddock in one area. So you can see genuinely 1912 National that competed in the the second ever Indy 500 next to some other pre-war thing, next to some other thing. You can go down the alley where most of the Formula One cars are paddocked. Go down where most of the Trans Am cars are paddocked. Um, It's just a delight, truly a delight. And the final thing to mention about this, Ryan, is you pick and choose and make it what you want. There's lots of running. The cars are on track, I think, at least four times, if not six, seven, eight times over the event. So there's a lot of on-track activity for each class. You get to see tons of on-track action. So what that means is you're not pressed like a normal racing event where you might get two practice sessions on a Friday, maybe a practice and a qualifying on Sunday. Uh, I'm sorry, two sessions on a Friday, maybe two on a Saturday, and then the race on Sunday. Here, there's so much going on that if you miss a session in the cars that you want to see, uh, there's no real concern. You can spend some time in the paddock or elsewhere enjoying. So it's kind of a a pick-your-own method of enjoying the event. Strongly, strongly recommended. Mm, you'll have to get out there at some point and do that one it's certainly on my bucket list um right turn lovers back and i can what? get his question i can get his question out there pretty quickly uh, and answered pretty quickly he says any idea he'll be on the commentary uh commentary duty for the Suzuka 10 hours this weekend um and that is we wrote on daily sports car that it will be sam collins ronnie quintale ronnie quintarelli and sonia ito uh, he also says is there any point in tuning in or are we facing the same grey-washed SRA sporting regs? Well, it should be an interesting race. Suzuka's a, a fantastic circuit. The entry list is good. It's got tons of cool drivers, cool cars. We've got, obviously, Callaway Corvette's going to be there. That's something you don't see very often. We've got a love chassis Lotus, which you don't see often racing in SRO competition. So there are certainly reasons to turn in, and I think Graham and, and RJ are out there, who are out there for uh, DailySportsCar.com are extremely excited. Um, it's going to be a really good event. They did a road run today with all the cars uh, going going through the town centre or city centre nearby. Uh, big crowds turned up for that, so I think the crowd's going to be big. Um, I think it's, you know, racing in places like Suzuka is... is you know, they're always fun to watch. It's a track that produces good racing generally. So I think it's certainly going to be worth turning, uh, tuning in. Let me throw one at you from Darius Lar, who says there's a Porsche 997 GT3 on the entry list for both Suzuka and Kailami. How competitive do you expect a car that is two generation, two generations old might be? He also says this being GT3, the BOP should ideally equalize it to the current generation cars right asked with tongue planted firmly in cheek well i don't know what your experience is like uh, with this sort of thing marshall but when you turn up to a race event with a gt3 car that's years old and has you know 
uh, been uh, outdated by newer duty free machinery from a manufacturer, you, you generally don't see yourself as being a, a contender for podiums and wins. And I would expect that's going to be the same here for the for the 997 duty free on the list. I think it, it wouldn't go down particularly well at a place like Porsche if if their car that's years a year or two generations old goes out and beats the brand new car. Boy, do we have an old car to sell to you? Don't bother with the new ones. Let's see. We've got time for one, maybe two more. Uh, da, 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 da. Can I ask you Raceaholic's question? I think that's quite an interesting one. The sure. one from UCR. I and think that's, that's a, long I think, enough to where I think it might be the final question of the episode. Yeah, exactly. And I think you're, you're the right man to answer this. He says, let's talk race strategy. Uh, a series of embraced BOP and performance windows, the opportunities to employ race strategy seem to have been greatly diminished. The primary opportunities that remain seem dependent on weather or caution periods. Besides not allowing uh, service to the car while fueling is being done, what, ch- uh, what changes to the regulations would you like to see to allow more strategy options for teams? I'd like to see more fuel strategy options made available. Specify a maximum fuel capacity for the class, regardless of the make and standardize the fuel flow rate, allowing allow teams to choose a fuel strategy that they think works best for their car and setup, and also forces them to react to strategy of the other teams. What do you think, Marshall? Main one here, Monsieur or Mrs. Raceaholic. The item that I believe has removed so much in the way of strategery creativity in strategery as i use some fun words here the minimum pit stop time i believe has taken out a lot of the a lot of the interesting ways to approach a race if i think about in i'll step out of sports car racing for a second but it's just because i've seen this work so many times if i think about the chip ganassi racing indycar team they are fairly well renowned for short filling their cars. If there is a, especially at tracks that are known for being more track position events than ones where if you have a good car, you can just freely pass. There's some tracks by design that end up being very hard to pull off passing maneuvers. Therefore leapfrogging folks in pit lane and then having to adjust your strategy as a result of that that is the thing that can improve your overall performance at the end of the race. And knowing that they will regularly do that, stop fueling one second, maybe two seconds before the tank is truly full, then asking their driver, that being usually Scott Dixon, to go out and make hellacious fuel economy to compensate for this advantage they've given themselves to get out faster, move ahead of cars and returning to pit, uh, returning to the race, and then hopefully through driver talent be able to capitalize on the shorter time spent on pit lane, if not have a yellow, possibly a caution fall in their favor to help uh, minimize that issue. That's a wonderful thing. I think painting things in the, I realize we're talking in general, isn't so we're not talking any specific sports car series, but I do agree when you get down to the point to where, you must be on pit lane for a minimum amount of time, no matter what it does. It does really start to mess with the creative opportunities in ways that I'm not too happy with Steven. I mean, heck we've even had a release this week from IMSA mandating what can or can't be communicated over a radio. Actually it was last week. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just come back to a, a, a general topic here. In the ongoing effort to address deficiencies in balance of performance application, the easy thing to do in saying, well, we never really get the cars right in terms of balancing them on the racetrack, let's try and balance just about everything else we can think of related to the race. And through that, maybe we can further refine equality across all cars. I just view this as a disease it is a sporting disease so now that we're down to a point in imsa where there are regulations as to what can or can't be said over the radio and i assume they're now going to have 
33 people in race control listening to every radio at all times and possibly applying penalties or recording all of them, having them all transcribed to listen for code that is speaking in code that's no longer available. Or, I mean, it's, I realize these are two different things between strategy and, and radio communications, but it's all the same symptom of the same disease. So, yeah, the idea of, hey, we're going into a race and we're going to dictate our own future. Mindset-wise, Stephen, those things are being stripped away more and more and more, and we are certainly seeing it play out in strategery as well. I don't know how we go backwards uh, unless people agree globally within sanctioning bodies or the people that pay money to compete in those series push back and say, no, this is too much. This is too much paint by the numbers. Stop. So I don't know how we get back to this from a practical standpoint, unless there's a a global realization or acceptance that, you know, we've maybe gone too far. Uh, Yeah, it's a disease. It's just truly a disease that is being allowed to grow and manifest. I hope it stops. And speaking of stopping, it's time to stop. I believe we have hit our hour and 15 Almost, uh, yeah, almost on the nose. So you got to go make calls. You got to go do your job. We just finished this job. Thank you, Stephen. Please stop hating our listeners. Um, maybe trying to tone for things. Don't make fun of Ryan Terpstra's uh, bowel issues. And other than that, I'm I want to say thank you to Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers and DailySportsCar.com. And we'll look forward to not only speaking to you next week, but we're also going to try and remember to send out a call for questions on Facebook as well.